All right. Hi, everyone, and thank you for uh, attending the Healthy Buildings webinar series. This is the first of the summer. And uh, we have today with us Jeff Hochberg. He is the Senior Consultant of Healthy Building Solutions at Catalyst Partners. And he's gonna be walking us through the well suite of healthy building rating systems. Uh, before we get started, I'm gonna put a little icebreaker. Um, can you, if you wanna put in the chat what your most exciting summer um, plan is, that'd be awesome. And um, just a little bit of housekeeping for you. Um, down at the bottom is a Q, is Q and A and chat. Um, the Q and A function is uh, for questions, and we do encourage you guys to use that um, if you do have questions instead of the chat because it does keep us more organized. Um, and uh, so, if you could use that, and then um, feel free to use the chat throughout the whole rest of the. Um, the series. Um, we do have a few um, more dates lined up. Some of them are not announced yet, so please check our newsletter uh, for those for those titles and topics. Um, our next one's going to be on July 13th. Uh, get a handle on hygiene, the aqueous ozone as an emerging healthy building technology. And um, and you can register for those at usgbcwm.org slash events. And Allie will be putting in the chat uh, the, the link to that event. And if you do love these webinars, if you find yourself coming to them, um, please uh, think about joining us as a member. Uh, you can scan the, co the QR code uh, to, and that will take you right to our membership. Uh, if you don't have a device with you, you can um, also go, go to the chat and Allie will be sending a link right there. And we also wanna thank our visionary uh, supporters. Without them, we cannot do this work. Uh, DTE Consumers Energy Eagle and Awagi Foundation. And before we get started, I also do wanna thank um, our partners, uh, 2030, uh, Detroit 2030 District um, and and our supporters of this webinar, Catalyst Partners and the International Well Building Institute. Um, without them, this, this webinar would not be possible. And with this agenda, um, we're gonna have Jeff be talking through, um, walking through the well rating systems, and then we have a Q&A afterwards. Um, we do have a poll, uh, a quick poll for you guys to get started. And uh, I'm gonna launch that right now, if you guys could just fill that out quickly. Um, and then uh, we'll have Jeff get started. So Jeff, if you wanna start sharing your slides. Great, thank you, Morgan. Is it uh, showing the way we want it to? It looks like it, yeah. Great. We're just going to give them a few more seconds to finish the poll. All right, I'm gonna end the poll uh, right now. And I'll share the results with you. Can you see those, Jeff? I can, thank you, yes. All right. All right, <clears throat> fantastic. Well, thank you all. Uh, Morgan for uh, inviting us to be here today to talk a little bit about well and thank all of you who have uh, logged on and and uh, given an hour of your morning uh, to uh, to sit in on this. Uh, hopefully by the end you won't regret that decision uh, and this will have um, been somewhat meaningful to you. Um, today what we're going to try to cover for you is really how the well building standard uh, from the start. How did it get how did it get started? Where did it come from? 
Uh, how has it evolved since it um, hit the marketplace in uh, 2014? Uh, we'll spend some time on the 10, what I call the 10 pillars. Uh, well calls them concepts. What are the 10 concepts? The, 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 the actual foundation of well, uh, we'll walk through those 10. I wanna cover for you today the, the growing suite of uh, well rating systems uh, from the original certification, uh, what's uh, new, uh, what's coming uh, down the pipe that we know of, uh, how do we apply those, how are they different uh, from each other. Uh, and then I think it's important to talk about the business case for healthy buildings. Um, does it make sense for us to do them? Does it make financial sense for us to do them? That's always part of the equation. Uh, there's some great research, uh, great case studies out now that are beginning to um, really give us a, a, a good uh, answer to that question. And then, of course, we'll leave time for uh, questions, answers uh, at the end uh, so that uh, we can get some dialogue going. All right. See if I can get the slides to move here. Okay, here we go. All right, so learning objectives will uh, follow the, um, the agenda. Um, I hope that at the end here, you'll understand a little bit about the research base and the scientific uh, background of the well building standard. Um, what are the focuses and the purposes of the different uh, well rating systems? And also understand uh, the business case for attaining well. So let's start with the evolution of well. In 2014, um, IWBI law, the IWBI, the International Well Building Institute, launched the well building standard. But the, the work on the project started really six years earlier. Uh, a group led by uh, Paul and Peter Sciala um, began the process of looking for uh, evidence-based research on the impact of indoor environments on the health of those people that were um, inhabiting that space. Uh, it took them six years, but at that point, they felt like they had the body of research identified. Uh, they had it peer reviewed and they organized the research into main areas of impact, uh, which we'll talk about today in the 10 concepts, uh, which led them to introduce the well building standard in 2014. By 2017, well was looking at communities and the well community uh, standard pilot uh, came out, um, followed by two milestones in 2018. Um, the second version of well came out in a pilot format uh, after feedback and input and uh, seeing the results of the, the original version from 2014. Uh, and the well portfolio was unveiled, which uh, was the first well at scale uh, rating. And we're going to talk about that term well at scale today uh, as the, the well uh, rating systems uh, continue to grow. 2020 was the scheduled time for uh, the Well V2 pilot to graduate into a uh, full Well um, version two, and it did that. Uh, but what was not expected and planned in 2020 was the coming of the pandemic. Uh, as you remember, uh, early in 2020, uh, when the pandemic first hit and, and offices and buildings and companies were shutting down and sending their, their workers home, um, to work out of our homes, uh, we were told, you know, figure on maybe three months and by summertime, we're going to be back uh, in our offices. But that didn't happen. The pandemic uh, continued to drag on and continued to expand across the world. And uh, design professionals, public health professionals, uh, organizations like the IWBI really turned a laser focus on buildings um, and how buildings can either hinder us uh, in the fight against COVID-19 and other airborne type viruses, or how they could help us. So in response to the pandemic, the IWBI formed a global task force on COVID-19. Uh, over 600 leading medical, public health practitioners, uh, business, uh, real estate professionals, scientists, sustainability experts, uh, members of academia all came together and they came out with a report titled The Prevention and Preparedness, Resilience and Recovery. It was the guidance around COVID-19, and that guidance is the report that led to the creation of the Well Health Safety Rating. 
Many of you have probably uh, seen that. Uh, there was a huge public awareness campaign that featured uh, Lady Gaga and Dr. Richard Carmona, um, Jennifer Lopez, Robert De Niro, a number of stars, uh, and the well health safety rating really took off. So if we look at the development of well, you know, we look at um, the growth of well on the left-hand side of this chart, uh, very, very, very small lines down in 2014, 2015, well, when well launched. And then as you come to the right, 2017, there's some steady uptake of well, and then portfolio comes out. And we get into the past little triangle there, which marks 2020. And as we move to the right here, and we get to the latter stages of 2020, you see the chart just explode. And this is when well health safety rating really took hold. Um, more than 2,000 companies, including 96 of the Fortune 500s, um, adopted well. Uh, and since the inception of the well health safety rating in 2020, mid-2020, over 2.1 billion, that's billion with a B, square feet of space and over 20,000 registered locations have achieved the well health safety rating. So that explosion on the right-hand side of the graph, they are up to over 3 billion square feet of um, space that are under well uh, certifications and rating systems. A lot of that was uh, tragically, very tragically driven uh, by the pandemic and the industry's uh, response to it. So let's talk a little bit about the well rating systems. And, and we're not gonna have time to get um, as deep as I'd love to with each of them, but I think we're gonna be able to give you a kind of an overview of, of how they work and how they're interconnected uh, and what the future may bring. If you look at the well building standard, on the far left here, we've got well certification. So that was what came out in 2014. Um, kind of a sister product to lead certification in many ways. Uh, needed a single building, uh, either that you were building new or doing a, a pretty substantial renovation um, on. And uh, that was the, the initial uh, piece that came out in 2014. Then I mentioned well portfolio and I used the term well at scale, which is now uh, kind of the new name for well portfolio. Uh, well Portfolio allows organizations who have multiple buildings uh, to select features within the well uh, certification um, total list of features and to put that to use. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, health safety rating, uh, we've just talked about its, uh, its explosive growth. Uh, policy and operations base uh, rating system, a subset of the uh, overall well certification set of features. Performance rating just was unveiled a little over a month ago. Um, performance rating, uh, whereas health safety rating is all about policies and operational procedures and maintenance procedures, performance rating is about building performance. It's all the aspects of how do we measure buildings, uh, measure smart buildings uh, to understand the actual performance aspects of that. It's a new certification, new rating that's just out uh, this year. We'll talk a little bit about that. And still to come down uh, later uh, planned for late uh, 2022 is the new health equity rating. Now this is gonna focus on uh, the features within uh, total certification again, they really focus on health equity uh, and diversity in buildings, making sure that uh, all occupants of buildings, so regardless of the type of building, have access to um, uh, features and um, components that, that help them with their health. So more to come on that. Um, there's a um, large advisory panel working on that now and, and stay tuned for health equity rating to be unveiled uh, later this year. So let's start off with well certifications. Go back to the start. This is the foundation for everything that's come after it. And we're gonna break this thing down. So I mentioned uh, on the agenda that the 10 pillars, the concepts of well, and across the top of this slide are those 10 concepts, air, water, nourishment, light, movement, thermal comfort, sound, materials, mind, and community. In the original well V1, uh, this was not 10. 
Uh, it was eight concepts. It's now been broken up in V2 to 10. Uh, and we'll talk about, we'll walk through each of these features. Uh, every single one of these features, back to that six years of work that went on before Well was unveiled, uh, every one of these features, um, as they relate to buildings, uh, impact health of human beings. And the research is solid uh, and it is pretty uh, in depth. And so we'll hit on a little bit of that as we go through the 10 features or the 10 concepts. Underneath those 10 concepts are 108 features. They're the uh, performance-based or the prescriptive, the design or policy or program uh, based or, or even operations and maintenance based requirements that um, uh, that fit under those 10 concepts. And of those 108 features, 48 of them are preconditions. Precondition means it's mandatory. You don't even get considered for well certification if you don't hit every single one of the preconditions. So that's where a project starts, right? Got to make sure you're going to hit all of the preconditions and that you can do that in your design. And then once you're certain of that, uh, then you move to what Well calls the optimizations. This is where you pick up your points. Optimizations are optional. There's many, many choices under each uh, feature that you can pick and choose from that match uh, your organization's objectives, your building objectives, your design. Uh, and so there's 172 optimizations within them uh, are even multiple points that, that total up to over 200 possible opportunities to grab points. Uh, and you get to, again, select which ones once you've got all the preconditions satisfied. Uh, from a, a well perspective, 40 points uh, gets you to bronze, which is the lowest level of well certification. 50 points gets you to silver, 60 to gold. And if you get over 80, you get to platinum. You can only get 100 points. So, uh, and in any one um, concept, you can't get more than 12. So there are a few uh, rules and regulations about how you can uh, achieve well, but that's the basic setup um, on how this works. And now let's uh, let's walk through each of the concepts here. All right, air is the first one, and it certainly has gotten the lion's share of the attention uh, the last two years as we've dealt with COVID. Um, high level indoor air quality uh, across the building's lifetime. So the um, uh, air uses uh, diverse strategies, um, source elimination. Uh, reduction, uh, active and passive building design, operation strategies, um, things like uh, obviously uh, smoke-free environments, uh, how much outdoor air can you bring in, uh, isolating and, and minimizing uh, contaminants, VOCs, uh, the types of things that come from uh, building supplies and furnishings and all of that. So um, uh, what's your outdoor air quality like? How much outdoor pollution are we bringing in? All of these are, are under the air um, concept. And we know that air quality le links directly to health conditions such as asthma, uh, even some allergies, upper respiratory conditions. So air quality and now um, um, virus and airborne virus control. And so uh, a huge, huge uh, focus on air today. Uh, next is water. So water addresses two things, not only access to high quality drinking water, but um, the management of water systems uh, that are used within building design. Uh, so it's the quality of the water, it's the distribution of the water, how easily accessible is it to uh, occupants of it, of the building, um, and the control of the water in the building. Um, contaminant thresholds of drinking water are measured. Um, things like um, how is water used in heating and cooling systems, irrigation, pools, uh, baths, uh, even general appliances. Uh, these uh, types of things are associated with things like Legionella. Uh, and so Legionella management falls under the water uh, concept as, as well. And we know that um, access to clean and quality drinking water impacts on health by A, providing hydration, which as a society, we don't do a very good job of keeping ourselves well hydrated, uh, and then minimizing gastrointestinal conditions. So there's the connection to uh, health there. 
Next is nourishment. Now, whereas air and water you might find in, uh, you find in lead um, building design, uh, nourishment is one of the um, human centered uh, uh, concepts that you wouldn't find in some of the other uh, building certifications. Um, we know the importance of nourishment um, in encouraging better eating habits, uh, creating food environments where the healthiest choice is the easiest one. So that's that's things like um, how you advertise and educate uh, your uh, employees, your occupants uh, as they're uh, picking what types of uh, food, um, locally sourcing your food, um, you know, transparency on what's in the food, those sorts of things. And we know that nutrition and health are closely related. A uh, number of um, modifiable risk factors uh, that we're all aware of um, related to food, obesity, um, diabetes, metabolic diseases, et cetera. Light is, a, is an interesting one. Um, because there's there's multiple aspects of light, but where it relates to health, and uh, this was um, I thought very uh, I'm just going to say eye opening. I shouldn't say that. Um, your eyes take in visual and non-visual cues during the day. You have photoreceptors in the retinas of your eyes that regulate your body's sleep and wake cycle or the circadian rhythm, and so disruption. Um, or desynchronization of that circadian rhythm actually has been linked to obesity, diabetes, depression, metabolic disorders, um, exposure to bright light at night um, through computer screens and cell phone screens, uh, laptops, um, really is associated with that phase, circadian phase disruption. Uh, that can cause, uh, even cause uh, increased risk for cancers, uh, metabolic diseases and sleep disorders. So lighting has become, again, um, a very, very big focus um, as we've become more of a, a digital and technological uh, technology-based society. Uh, and this is one that a lot of organizations are focusing on. Movement is another one of the features that is human-centric in well. And movement is not only, hey, uh, let's remind people to get up and move around during the day, um, but movement uh, as a feature uh, involves design. Um, for example, when you walk into a door of a building, do you find a bank of elevators in front of you? Or do you find a big, open, wide staircase, perhaps with a little light music playing, plants planted along, where people tend to gather? Are we encouraging by our design people to move uh, as opposed to be sedentary? Because we know that as a society, our homes and schools and workplaces um, and jobs and even transportation have been designed to demand less movement of people um, rather than more. Uh, movement is also where we find ergonomic design in, in the well um, certification and well suite. So, um, sit-stand desks. I'm at a standing desk right now. Um, ergonomically adjustable chairs, computer monitors, uh, workstations, all of the ergonomics falls under the uh, movement uh, feature, uh, as does physical activity spaces, indoor and out, um, self-monitoring uh, facilities for active occupants. So that's, uh, are there rooms for people to lock up their bicycles if they ride? to work or to uh, a space that they're spending time. Thermal comfort is um, actually uh, very interesting in the way it impacts upon health as well. Um, it, yes, it impacts energy use, high humidity, uh, running your HVAC, cooling, heating, certainly is a, a huge um, impact on our energy use. But it also um, plays a large way a role in, in our health. So studies have shown that thermal comfort um, impacts on human satisfaction in buildings, and it impacts things like motivation, alertness, focus, and mood. Uh, recent research indicates that employees perform 15% poorer when the office is overheated and 14% poorer when the office is cold. 
So we've got a temperature balance uh, consideration uh, as it relates to productivity, as it relates to uh, focus and mental alertness. Uh, we also have uh, an issue with thermal comfort as it relates to um, moisture, moisture and mold control, um, humidity control, um, and um, how each individual has an opportunity to control their own space as it relates to being hot or being cold or having air blowing on them and all of that. Next concept is sound. And this is not only um, uh, how do we put in sound uh, mapping, how do we uh, put up uh, cubicles and barriers to, to uh, stop sound from moving from one area to the next, but um, Recent uh, studies, again, are showing that exposure to noise sources, whether that's traffic or transportation um, or HVAC equipment near where you're uh, stationed, where you spend your time indoors, appliances, other people talking, uh, hinders productivity, it hinders focus, it hinders memory uh, retention. So uh, the sound concept looks at how do we minimize all of those things uh, and create um, uh, productive and healthy spaces related to noise. Materials uh, looks at uh, human exposure to uh, hazardous building materials, both in the building and construction phases and then in the occupancy phases. Um, we're dealing with um, VOCs, volatile uh, organic compounds that uh, encompass a large range of chemicals. Uh, they're natural, they're of artificial origin, but they readily vaporize at room temperature. And so they come off of uh, furniture and uh, adhesives that lay carpeting down and uh, chemicals that are in the various uh, materials that we, we create spaces with. So um, cleaning products and um, protocols within indoor spaces can introduce um, uh, hazardous chemicals into the air and into the space where people inhabit. So the materials concept addresses um, all of those requirements. Mind is one of the human-centered um, concepts in well, and coming off of the last two years and the uh, serious mental health challenges that we as a, a nation, as a, as a global community have, have faced with uh, COVID and all of the uh, tragic um, consequences and inconveniences that, that it's brought. Uh, mental health has taken a, a very um, front seat position in the well-being, uh, wellness world uh, in general. The mind concept is where that all factors in here uh, to well. Uh, so mental health promotion, uh, making sure there's uh, opportunities for um, uh, restorative uh, time on your own, relief. Um, and and we're, we're looking at this to try to uh, reduce the effects of anxiety and depression and pain and stress. And uh, so mental health is a, is a big piece of this. A lot of organizations are focused on this. And community is the last concept. Um, this is um, uh, designed to support access to essential health care, uh, build a culture of health that um, really um, accommodates diverse population needs. Um, and establishes a really inclusive, engaged occupant community. Uh, the design and policy and operation strategies here uh, address health disparities. Uh, they promote social diversity um, and real connection to community um, and um, civic engagement, family support, and emergency preparedness fits into this. It's one of the big criteria in the Well Health Safety Rating. Uh, but being um, uh, connected to your community, um, either for the next pandemic or for other number of other types of uh, civic type emergencies. So these are the 10 concepts that are the building blocks for well. Um, each of the rating systems either uses all of them in the case of well certification 
or pulls from them in the case of the uh, next rating systems that we're going to talk about. All right, so let's hit well portfolio or now what we're calling well at scale. Um, IWBI realized early on that many organizations were not going to be presented with the opportunity to build a new building or to totally go in and renovate or gut an existing building. Yet the features under well um, were of great value to organizations and that any steps to uh, improve their um, uh, indoor spaces, whether that was retail space or office space or uh, higher education space, uh, whatever that space was, that any opportunity to improve those was valuable and that organizations ought to be able to um, uh, make those improvements to the requirements and be able to leverage the, the value of having done that. So Well Portfolio said, if you have more than one building, you could be doing things throughout those buildings, never once hitting certification in any of them uh, or being close, but measuring a score, measuring an organizational level to which you could strive to improve from year to year to year. And in the case of uh, what's up on the screen, if your organization's goal is what many are right now to reopen safely and with confidence, uh, the concepts of mind, community, water, air, and materials um, are, the, are the ones that you might focus on in the various strategies. And, and in doing so, you can uh, score your organization uh, as you submit the documentation supporting what you've done uh, through well you get a, um, a progressive scorecard. And this was the beginning of the well portfolio score or now the well at scale score. Uh, as you, um, uh, so let's, let's take an example. Let's say you're a, a college and you're gonna make, uh, you've got plans on the books to make improvements uh, in your dining halls, um, uh, increasing the percentage of locally sourced foods and you've got projects on the books to add meditation rooms to some of the residential halls um, and you're updating the lighting in the administrative offices to LED from fluorescent. Uh, now none of those improvements are going to, to qualify either of those spaces for full certification um, but uh, each of those buildings individually and spaces improved their well score uh, and their combined contribution to the college, to the organization itself, improves the college's score. And so that score now can be used to demonstrate to stakeholders, uh, prospective students, uh, current students, uh, staff, potential staff hires, faculty that you're trying to bring in. You can show that the college is focused on the health and well being of all of the occupants of your space. And that uh, is being seen to be a, a huge advantage. Uh, in today's uh, marketplace. So the well portfolio score also now um, uh, allows the, the work that organizations are doing to be divided into five categories, human and social capital, uh, performance, diversity, equity, and inclusion, sustainability and resilience, organizational culture and employee performance, and employee health and safety. And each of those uh, areas are the very areas that are going into ESG reporting, uh, environmental social governance reporting, corporate social responsibility reporting, annual reports. And so all of an organization's work, regardless of whether they can hit full certification or not, can be leveraged and can be promoted and can be used uh, to make sure that the organization's stakeholders uh, are aware of the organization's efforts. Next came the well health safety rating. We talked a little bit about its growth, why, why it was created, um, when it was created. Uh, its full name is the well health safety rating for facility operations and management. And the focus here is on operational policies and maintenance protocols, uh, occupant engagement, communication, uh, emergency plans, uh, and emergency preparation and that sort of thing. Uh, the five, um, main strategies here are across the top, cleaning and sanitization uh, procedures, emergency preparedness programs, health service resources, air and quality water management, uh, and stakeholder engagement and communication. 
And under those five um, strategies are 22 possible features uh, showing that you're supporting proper hand washing, you've developed an emergency preparedness plan, et cetera. Um, any organization applying for health safety rating only has to hit 15 of these and you get to pick which 15 they are. So depending on where your organization is, if you've got fantastic and well-developed uh, policies um, and procedures, you can select the features that are more designed around that. Um, if you've got a pretty well-performing building and you wanna look at uh, air and quality water, water management and some of the building performance items, you can go there. So you need to get 15 out of the 22. This is a one-year rating has to be renewed every year uh, and it is scalable. So if you have uh, one location, multiple locations, multiple buildings on a campus, you can apply for and work for um, health safety rating across all of them concurrently. And well, health safety rating is for any type of facility. We uh, right now have sports and entertainment venues, Yankee Stadium, a number of uh, NBA uh, arenas, uh, across the world, soccer uh, arenas, um, movie theaters, uh, hospitality hotels and resorts. You can see all these different facility types. Uh, there are currently uh, health safety rated um, uh, awardees in all of these feature types. Uh, each one's gonna be a little bit different as to the types of uh, the, the actual um, features that you're gonna pick, uh, but it, it applies across the board. Okay, so the well health safety rating is all policy and operations based. Um, there is no on site um, testing done to get well health safety uh, in subsequent years, years two, three, et cetera. You have to submit data that shows that you're monitoring certain features like air quality and water quality, but it's primarily documentation and policy and operations uh, procedure based. The well performance rating, which just was unveiled a month ago, um, is all uh, building performance based. So uh, those two are different, but they um, uh, certainly work together. And you can see where uh, they come from different components of the overall well certification. Uh, well, performance rating can be earned, again, as a standalone designation. It can be a step towards um, either well health safety rating or full well certification. Uh, it can be used uh, by an organization in their portfolio or well at scale score. So let's look at the well performance rating. Um, there are 33 measurable performance-based strategies. Um, across indoor air quality, water quality management, light measurements, thermal conditions, acoustic performance, environmental monitoring, and occupant experience. 33 measurable strategies within uh, those seven uh, major categories. And, there, and to get well performance, you have to meet the requirements on 21. Once again, you get to pick which 21 those are. And the um, uh, there is documentation that is submitted, but in the case of well performance rating, there is either on-site testing that must be performed to validate um, uh, the meeting of all of those requirements, or could be continuous monitoring through uh, smart systems, uh, sensors, uh, that sort of thing that are installed in those facilities. And then occupant surveys is getting that um, occupant feedback on, you know, how's the temperature, what's the air quality uh, like, um, uh, do I find myself coughing in certain areas of the building, what about water quality and all that. So the occupant survey or the occupant engagement is a piece of the uh, well performance rating. And then still to come later this year is the well health equity rating. It's gonna be focused on uh, aspects of um, uh, building design and operations that really focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, making sure that all uh, individuals have uh, equal access uh, to the uh, benefits of healthy buildings and uh, how that uh, helps us in, in um, 
uh, outside of the building, uh, health services and, and that sort of thing. Okay, um, got a few more minutes here. So I wanna quickly go through some of the, uh, the business case for Well. Some of what the early adopters to Well were able to um, find out um, and um, how you would go about making that business case if you were looking at uh, a building or a property uh, that you feel like might be a great candidate for well. So in 2018, the Urban Land Institute Center for Sustainability and Economic Performance did a study on the early adopters of well, and they shared their company's experience in building to well, including the additional cost incurred during the build. And this is a, always a big question. If I'm going to, to I'm, I'm putting a building up, I'm doing a renovation on a building, uh, I'm thinking of doing well, but what's that going to cost me in addition to what I might already be committed to spend? And so the early adopters um, across the board completed their fit out, some of them for less than a dollar, an additional dollar per square foot in additional costs, uh, others somewhere between one and four dollars a square foot in additional costs. Um, and that all of those early adopters said that the, the largest expense categories that they um, had to face were acoustics, uh, enhanced uh, HVAC filtration and zone control, which ties to not only air quality, but thermal comfort, and the increased employee access and nourishment. So how they were improving over uh, vending machines and, and the like. Um, now the range of the cost to build to well was also impacted by a couple things. One, what was the original plan? Was this going to be just a building, um, a well-built building to local code? And now we're saying, hey, let's take this up to well. Uh, or was it uh, going to be a lead silver building? And now we just have to add a little bit to well. So some of that variation uh, was in uh, what was it going to be um, before we said, hey, let's, let's try to take this to well. The other variation was where along the process was well introduced. Uh, was it at the beginning of the project when all the stakeholders were together and trying to figure out what's this building, what's this space going to be, and how is it going to have the greatest impact on the occupants? Or did it happen midstream? Did work have to get redone? Did design have to get redone? Did materials have to get shipped back uh, in, in, in return for uh, updated materials? So uh, that was another piece of this. And as we get better at this, hopefully, that discussion goes on at the start of projects and not uh, somewhere midstream. Uh, so with that additional cost, what was the return on investment? And we've got some good studies showing the return. Uh, Kundal, uh has um, did well certified workplaces and they were able to measure that employee absenteeism dropped by 19% in just one year. Uh, CBRE, and their Toronto and Vancouver well-certified place uh, workspaces uh, found that their total employee turnover rate fell by almost a third and their hiring rate for new talent is almost double. And Landsec in London, their well-certified uh, silver workplace, they measured productivity increases of 30%. Uh, for real estate developers and um, property managers. Um, there have been some studies around that piece. Uh, May of 2021, uh, the UN Environment Program Finance Initiative, they partnered with the Center for Active Design and Bentall Green Oak, and they conducted the largest health and wellness study of global real estate investment managers to date. They found that um, those folks, uh, those um, real estate investment managers were reporting that the healthy buildings were achieving higher sale premiums up to 31%. They were achieving faster sale times. Uh, they had up to 23% higher occupancy rates uh, and they were able to bring in higher rent income, uh, about 8% higher, up to 8% higher than buildings that were not healthy buildings. Uh, MIT did a study uh, in uh, 2020 through their um, real estate innovation lab. The study was the financial impact of healthy buildings. And their study found that healthy building um, rents were transacting between four and a half and 7.7 more per square dollars more per square foot than uh, other nearby um, buildings were that were not 
uh, healthy buildings, and that nearly one in two building owners uh, reported that they were leasing their spaces more quickly than they were their conventional spaces, their healthy building spaces. Um, and then from an investment perspective, um, study by Lefty and Horn tracking the market performance of companies that integrate a culture of health and safety. Uh, healthy companies were found to dramatically outperform their peers. Portfolios that had included companies with high scores on the Corporate Health Achievement Awards appreciated 99% more than the value of S&P 500 index companies did. So there's, there um, appears to be um, a business case here for a number of stakeholders, right? Um, if you're managing properties and building properties for rental, higher rents and higher occupancy rates. Uh, if you're uh, building a building and you're putting your workers or workforces to work there, increased occupant productivity, reduced absenteeism, increased employee retention. And then from the investor perspective, um, higher investment returns on buildings that are healthy buildings. So um, when you look at these results and, and things like higher rents and occupancy rates and all of these things on this, on this slide, what occurs to me is that these things are repeatable. Year after year after year, you get these returns. As opposed to the one-time cost, which could be, um, based on the study, is up to $4 per square foot greater. But it's a one-time cost. And these returns um, produce year after year after year. All right. Um, we're running up on time here, so I'm going to stop it here, Morgan, uh, and let's uh, open it up for questions. Okay. Um, our first question is, is there a list of well buildings with health scores available to the public? Okay. Good question. Yes, there is. Um, as projects do well buildings, uh, they get to choose whether uh, they would like to publicize what they've done um, and how much information is out there. So if um, in, in the attendees here can go to wellcertified.com, wellcertified.com. And, and, and by the way, the links to the research articles that I cited here in these last few slides, and these links will send out um, as a follow up to the, to the um, webinar. Now, Morgan will send that out. Uh, but wellcertified.com, you can actually go in and look at the various projects. Some have been more forthcoming with uh, data and information uh, um, than others. Uh, and uh, I, I'd, I'd have to look and see whether you can get an access, get access to well scores. Now that's when I'll check on. Awesome. Uh, another question is uh, what sets well apart from LEED and other certifications? Okay, good question. So what sets well apart? <clears throat> Well, from LEED, um, and LEED has been around since you know the, the 1990s, right? Um, the main difference between WELL and LEED is the four human-centered concepts that WELL has added, right? Movement, nourishment, mind, and community. Um, the other six, air and water and light and sound and materials, um, and uh, what's the, there's one other. Uh, the other six that are building oriented are very similar to LEED. And in fact, if you're doing a LEED building, many of the credits in LEED cross over to the features in WELL. Uh, so that's something to remember too. If you're doing, if you're already in the process of doing LEED, if you're already in the process of, of um, enterprise green communities, if you're in the process of some of these other rating systems, there are crossovers and what they call them crosswalks. And in many cases, um, meeting requirements in one gives you the requirement in the other. Uh, so that's something to be very, very, very aware of, kind of getting a little bit uh, more bang for your buck uh, is you can get potentially uh, a number of these. So that's the main difference between well and lead. 
Um, the other rating systems are also um, have some a crossover to well. Um, uh, and I, I wouldn't say one's better than another. Uh, it's it's really the you know what is the objective of what uh, your organization uh, is trying to do or trying to build. Uh, what fits your objectives best. Um, one thing I love about well is that it's progressive. There's, there's a constant flow of new rating systems that um, allow you to kind of get your feet wet, uh, like health safety rating, um, allows you to kind of get your feet wet, just, just submitting uh, policies and procedures and operations uh, guidance uh, before going full-fledged for well the new performance rating for buildings that are really, really great performing uh, or built well uh, from a performance aspect, a great way to start into the well uh, ecosystem uh, with, with some of those. So um, that is one difference be, uh, with well is the number of different uh, ways you can get into the process uh, without having to, you know, you can, put your, you can put your toe in the water before having to dive in. Yeah, it seems like uh, any sort of building situation could be in the well rating system. Yeah, correct. Thank you. Um, then another question is, um, if someone's interested in doing a well project, where do you suggest that they start? Right, okay. Well, so I would, I would say there's a couple things you could do. If you're just interested in reading more about the various um, rating systems, what are the features, what are the requirements around that. You can go on wellcertified.com. The, uh, the website uh, has been recently updated uh, and, and it's, it's got much more information on there, much easier to, to work your way through. If you'd like to talk to somebody who's been through it, uh, who's been through not only the actual building component piece of it, but also the process of certification, the process of attaining a rating, uh, then I think you want to talk to a group like Catalyst Partners um, or a group that has uh, some experience within the rating systems. Um, find, I would recommend finding somebody who is um, uh, credentialed as a well AP, um, either from the design side uh, or from the, the broader side of design and the certification process. Um, but I, I, would, I would try those two things to start. Awesome. And uh, if you'd like to, you could, uh, would you like to talk more about Catalyst Partners and the services your company offers in relation to Well? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, so at Catalyst Partners, which is based out of Grand, Grand Rapids, um, our Healthy Building Solutions team, and I think some of my partners are uh, on the call today, um, really looks at the, at the, the total ecosystem from the um, assistance in the design uh, portion of how do you design to well or lead or bream um, or um, enterprise green communities or any of the others. Um, how do you um, prepare your materials for the certification process, which can be its own, um, um, its own animal of how to do that well, um, to how do you uh, prepare for the on-site verification testing if you're doing performance rating or full well, um, to the ongoing monitoring um, of systems and all. And, and at Catalyst, we've got all those pieces. Uh, we've got the uh, energy modeling team. We've got the um, multifamily residential team. We've got the healthy building solutions team. And we all integrate uh, that together. Uh, so um, we've got um, I would say all of the pieces necessary to either just have that first conversation and figure out, you know, is this project even a candidate for well? Um, or I'm thinking of a project down the road. What do I need to be doing now so that I don't get three months into it and then have to back up and, and start again? Uh, to if you've already got a project going and you want to see if you can get well um, integrated into it. Uh, while it's running, uh, we can do all of those things and, and help you make those determinations and, and figure out uh, which way to go. Awesome. Well, I think that's it for our questions. If um, anyone else wants to 
ask more questions. We've got a few more minutes, but um, I am going to put up a, our last poll um, while we're we're seeing if another question comes in. Um, let me put that on here. And I do just want to thank you guys for your particip participation in the polls and attending our first Healthy Buildings webinar series of the summer. Uh, and be sure to look for upcoming webinars uh, at our usgbcwm.org slash events and through our newsletter. If you haven't signed up for our newsletter, please do. Uh, lots of content, green jobs, uh, community partner events, um, and so forth. Um, you will get us you will be sent a recording of this webinar and we will send you a pdf of the presentation with the links and reports that uh that jeff was referring to um and at the end of this webinar there will be a survey um and it's just two questions and it'll be open in your browser if you could please uh, fo uh follow up with that survey that would be wonderful so that we can um cater these webinars to our audience um, I think that's it for me, um, wrapping up and I just want to thank you guys again, uh, Jeff, thank you. I, I'm not sure. I don't see any other, um, questions coming in. Uh, do you have any parting, um, words? <laughs> well, I, I think that, you know, the, the growth um that growth curve we saw on on the slide about you know how the how the well suite of products is has grown in, uh, since you know the pandemic's uh, influence you know I, I don't know if that's going to continue at, at, at such a high clip uh, but i think what we're seeing is that healthy buildings the design of healthy buildings the importance of health, healthy buildings uh is a movement that's here to stay so I guess I would encourage uh, those that are in the whatever uh, piece of the industry, whether it's um, building uh, and design and construction or the real estate management, real estate development side, um, or even the just uh, the well uh, employer based wellness uh, world. I would encourage you all to start um, really seeing how any one of these rating systems might help you again well has made a, a, a great effort to, to give little steps here. Uh, health safety rating, uh, performance rating, health equity rating is coming. And I expect there may be more uh, ways to kind of get your feet wet uh, to get into the ecosystem of healthy buildings and well buildings. And I would encourage you, uh, regardless of the, waiting, of the rating system, to really uh, be part of the movement. And let's see if we can push this and move this uh, this needle way forward. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff, so much. Um, it looks like everyone um, is is pretty interested in, in the well building standard and other certifications. So um, that's great. Thank you guys for uh, doing those polls for us. It does help us with our information. And thank you, Jeff, for your discussion today. Um, you guys have a great uh, rest of your day and have a great Memorial weekend. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate you taking the time.